Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's very nice to be back here. I'm sorry, uh, I have to give this talk in English. Um, I try to, I try to, <laughs> try to speak slowly. Um, does everybody have a handout? No? No. Uh, there must be extra copies around. Il y a de la place à l'intérieur encore hein, pour le mettre dehors. Il y a de la place ici ou de, sur le. Vraiment, il y a. So. Are we ready to start? Everyone now has a hand up. Good. Um, okay, well, my plan for this talk is to begin by sketching a certain picture of the explanatory relationship between meaning and rule following and uh, purely factual dispositions of use and truth conditions and norms of use, these, these phenomena. Um, so I'll begin by sketching a picture of how these relate to one another, and then I'll try to fill out that picture by um, trying to answer a number of questions about it. So uh, here goes. Now, uh, in this explanatory model, which is on the top of the handout, um, as you can see, uh, the idea is that the meaning of a word is constituted by our following certain rules for the word's use. And these rules are followed in virtue of our having certain linguistic dispositions or propensities. Uh, this is on the left-hand side. Then, then going in the other direction, the meaning of a word explains its truth condition or a satisfaction condition. And that truth condition or satisfaction condition um, explains why certain uh, <coughs> norms govern the use of the word. Um, now, let me be a, bit, a little, little more specific, turning to the right-hand side of the picture, where I'm saying the same thing, but in a little more detail. So as you can see there, the idea is that the explanatory ground the bottom. The ground is made of certain non-normative, non-semantic facts, uh, facts of word use. And these facts uh, are facts to the effect that a person S's use of a word W is governed by a certain law-like regularity, let's say R of W, some regularity, a law-like regularity governing the deployment of this word W, uh, where, and I'm going to go into this in more detail a little bit later, but it's important is that this law, this law-like regularity, is in a certain sense that I'll be elaborating um, a simplification or a first approximation or an idealization. Uh, that's one point about it to bear in mind. I'll be talking about that in a minute. And another thing that turns out to be important is that the law is operative in a given person, partly as a result of um, corrective reinforcement by the members of the person's community. Okay. Anyway, that's just to indicate the nature of the explanatory ground, in my view. Now, at the next level up, and constituted by these facts uh, of... Uh, these basic phenomena of word use, there are facts about which rules of word use the person S is following. So specifically, what I'm claiming is that the fact that S's use of W is governed by a certain ideal law, R of W, 
constitutes the fact that S is following the rule conform with R of W. Now, at the next level up, at the third level, I say that we find facts concerning what words mean. Um, facts like person S means dog by W, where um, the word dog here, written in, I'm imagining written in capital letters, uh, um, names a meaning or a concept. So the reason I have F there in the capital F is to schematically indicate that what's plugged in there is the name of a concept or the name of a meaning. The concept or meaning expressed by the word F in lowercase letters. Okay. Um, okay, now um, at the next level, the fourth level, according to me, there are somewhat weaker semantic facts concerning the conditions in which a word is true of a given object. Um, these facts are entailed and explained by the facts of meaning, but not the other way around. Okay, so it's a one-way direction. Uh, finally, at the very top, we find norms of usage, facts about when it would be desirable to apply W to a given thing. And in my view, as I'll explain, uh, these norms are determined directly by the facts regarding when an application of W would be true. Okay, so that's the, the picture that I want to defend, that's the general idea. Now, as I said, let me uh, try to make that plausible and clearer by answering some uh, questions, some objections and questions of clarification. And they're listed as we have a handout. Okay, what do I have in mind by an ideal law when I say that the, uh, the use of W is governed by an ideal law? person's use is governed by an ideal law. Well, what's crucial is for me is that uh, the notion of ideal law that I'm relying on here is a very familiar one in science, in giving scientific explanations. Uh, as I indicate there, you can think of ideal gases, ideally rigid bodies, ideal planes, Kepler's laws of planetary motion are in some sense idealized. Um, now, what's done in these cases, and now I'm, I'm not talking specifically about language anymore, just the way this notion of an ideal law is used in, in science, uh, the strategy is to account for the behavior of a certain system by treating that behavior as the product of two kinds of, force, of causal factor. On the one hand, there's a set of laws that are always operative. That's one kind of causal factor, but they don't account for the behavior on their own. Uh, in addition, there is a set, an array of further factors, each of which may or may not be present on a given occasion. Now, uh, the idea is that the laws on their own would perfectly explain the system's behavior in the absence of these further factors. So, although these so-called laws are not quite right with respect to the actual system, because after all, its behavior is also affected by these further factors, um, we can think of these laws as describing a hypothetical system in which the further factors are absent. And so it's natural then to refer to these laws as ideal laws, laws governing the idealized system in which the further factors are absent. And it's natural to call the further factors, say, distorting factors. Okay. 
Now, um, what's important is that to see that there's nothing uh, <coughs> normative or non-naturalistic in any of this. Uh, the judgment that a given system should be modeled in this sort of way and specific hypotheses about what in particular the ideal laws should be and what the array of distorting factors should be um, are assessed on standard methodological grounds, as one does in science, by looking at considerations of empirical adequacy, uh, overall simplicity, uh, consonance with other successful theories in science, and so on. You look at the best model judged by the same criteria that you always use in, in judging the plausibility of a scientific theory. So there's nothing non-naturalistic, there's nothing normative, evaluative, really, although some of that terminology you know, might, might suggest that it's normative, it isn't really. Um, okay. So much for the first point. Um, now, another question that can be one might raise about the explanatory ground uh, is, um, as I do in question two, what's the point of bringing in uh, that a person's, the law operating in a given person is partly the result of corrective reinforcement? Why, why bring that in? What does that mean? And what's the point of having it there? Well, the point of having it is, as I indicate here, to motivate talk of rule following. Um, okay. To explain why we find it natural to think in terms of rule following. And this, of course, applies to the rules of grammar as well as to the rules constituting the meanings of words. We do find it natural to talk about rule following. Why? Well, first thing that's important to see is that um, there's a kind of paradigm of rule following, pure, ordinary case of rule following. As, for instance, if somebody teaches you a game and they show you the rules, and you read the rules, and you understand the rules, and you do what the rules say. Okay, that is the paradigm, uh, full-blooded, pure case of rule following. Now, um, obviously, if <clears throat> understanding a word, meaning a certain thing by a word, is going to be thought of as constituted <coughs> by rule following, um, it cannot be that kind of explicit, full-blooded rule following. Because that kind of explicit paradigm case of rule following presupposes that you already have a language which you understand, and the rules are written down, and you understand them, and you do what they say. Okay. So it can't be that all understanding of language, and I'm including here languages of thought, uh, is constituted by that kind of rule form. So we're going to need to have some kind of weaker or watered-down notion of rule following doesn't doesn't have all the characteristics that the paradigm pure case of rule following does. Uh, so just to put a label on it, we need some notion we might call implicit rule following. Doesn't take place by first of all understanding the rule and then doing what it says. It has to be a, a kind of rule following that's simply implicit in what is done. Okay. Um, now, okay, so suppose we, what kind of rule following can we have? On the other hand, we don't want to go too far. I mean, we've got some ex extremes on either side, which we need to avoid. The kind of rule following we want, as I've indi just indicated, can't be the full-blooded, explicit kind. On the other hand, we can't say that whenever we've got a law, even whenever we've got an idealized law, we have rule following, you know, as the examples I give indicate. So consider the motion of the planets. Uh, well, in a way, Kepler's laws are ideal laws. In fact, they're 
other factors that distort the orbits from the ones that Kepler's laws would predict. Uh, but it would be, you know, we have no inclination to think of the planets as following rules uh, in, in their motion. Um, you might be tempted to think, well, it's got to have to do with the person. You know, the planets have got nothing to do with the person. But even within the person, like perhaps the, the behavior of the digestive system could be modeled by ideal laws, but nobody would be tempted to think that we're following rules. So uh, we need to bring in something else to, to motivate talk about rule following. And what seems to me to be the, the thing that we can bring in to explain why we're tempted to speak about rule following in the cases where we are, even when it's merely implicit, is that the ideal law that's in operation is in some way molded or sustained by some way the result of um, some kind of uh, correction. Um, um, most naturally, most normally from outside. So that's the reason I bring in uh, the notion of corrective reinforcement to motivate the talk about rule following. All right, now I turn to uh, the relation between the ground level facts and the facts at the level of rule following. Um, the question is, how has Kripke's problem of error been addressed? Um, now, what is Kripke's problem of error? Kripke says, look, uh, of course, Kripke's himself in his discussion in his book um, called what? Wittgenstein on following a rule or something like that. Rules in private language. Yeah. Well, of course, his tenor of his discussion is in the end skeptical. He thinks uh, that you cannot reduce following a rule to certain non normative naturalistic. Because there's something called the problem of error that he thinks can't be solved. Uh, basically, his line of argument is this. He says, as I indicated at the beginning here, on the, the first section of, under question three, um, he thinks that the analysis would have to have something like the form I give there. S follows rule R. Um, actually, I name the rules by putting R with an exclamation mark, exclamation mark, because R is actually a regularity. And so putting the explanation mark afterwards means the rule conform to that regularity, the instruction conform to that regularity. So Kripke says, look, the, the presumably the, the law, sorry, the, the, the reductive analysis would have something like this form. Uh, to say that a person follows a given rule R, is to say that they would conform with that regularity under some kind of ideal conditions. Because, of course, the vital thing here is that you can follow a rule without always obeying it. Okay. It can be your rule, and yet you make some kind of mistake, or you know, you're drunk or something, and you don't actually do on every given occasion what the rule tells you supposed to do. You're still following it, you're trying, as it were, to conform, but without succeeding. Okay, so that means that since you can be following a rule without actually satisfying it, you can't simply look at what someone actually does and read off immediately without any problem what's the rule. Um, the rule can't be some generalization that their behavior satisfies because they can be making mistakes. So the mistakes need to be ruled out. And this is what he says, that although you can't read off from their actual behavior what the rule is, maybe you can read off from what that behavior would be in ideal conditions. Where they wouldn't be drunk, or they wouldn't be making mistakes. You can tell what the rule is. And the problem is, for Kripke, how do you specify in some a priori way what these ideal circumstances are in which people wouldn't make mistakes? And he argues very plausibly that you can't sort of sit down and make a list of exactly what the conditions would be. Okay, so he doesn't think this problem can be satisfied. But what I'm suggesting is that that way of setting the problem up has a false presupposition. We really 
don't need to be able to come up a priori with some list of conditions in which people would not make a mistake in whatever rule they're following. Um, the methodology is instead the one that I indicated when I was talking about uh, how you discover uh, the ideal law governing a given system. Um, it's not an a priori matter at all. Uh, you use scientific methodology in general and simplicity considerations, considerations of empirical adequacy to, as it were, simultaneously come up with some model which involves, sorry, simultaneously involves postulating certain ideal laws and postulating some array of potential distorting factors uh, where, if in fact, that array of distorting factors can at least be somewhat open-ended. You don't even need really to, in making it plausible that something is the, the law, to think you've exhausted the list of all the possible things that could lead to deviations from it. Okay, and this is a fully empirical matter. No aspect of it is a priori. Um, so the problem that Kripke thinks needs to be solved to, uh, to deal with the problem of error doesn't need to be solved, really. Once you've got the empirical, the plausible empirical model, which involves saying this is the ideal law, and these are the potential fact, distorting factors, then you can say, well, the, the errors are the cases where the ideal law is not being satisfied. Okay. Now, um, my final point here is that it's, I can seem, I think it maybe is the case, that Kripke is anticipating this strategy in his book. Um, I don't know if anyone's got it here, but uh, he seems at some point, to be, to, he says something like this, look, let nobody under the influence of too much philosophy of science think that you can solve this problem by bringing in considerations of simplicity. That would be a terrible error, he says, to think you can bring simplicity in to solve this problem. Um, because where you bring simplicity in is where you've got in mind two definite hypotheses and you're trying to decide which of them is more plausible. You've got two hypotheses, both of them reasonably empirically adequate. Which is more plausible? Well, the simplest, the simplest one. That's the legitimate use of simplicity, he says. But um, you don't bring in simplicity to tell you, as it were, what the hypotheses mean. You know, and in this case, our problem is to say, what does it mean to suppose this person is following this rule? So how can simplicity be relevant to that? You know, it's not a question of judging between two hypotheses, it's a question of trying to decide what the hypotheses mean, which say he's following this rule or he's following that rule. So simplicity can't be relevant. Well, I agree with uh, Kripke's general point about where you should be bringing simplicity in, but I think it's just off target with respect to this particular proposal. Because I'm not bringing in simplicity in order to answer the question, what does it mean to say that the person is following this rule? The answer to that question I'm giving is a purely a priori conceptual answer. I'm saying to say the person follows this rule is what that means is to say that this is the ideal law governing their behavior. Okay. Simplicity hasn't been brought in. Where you bring in simplicity is to determine, well, what is in fact the ideal law that governs their behavior? And therefore, what is the rule that they're following implicitly? Okay. So I don't think Kripke's reply works. Right. Moving over the page. <clears throat> Another, sorry, okay. Um, this is another, um, well, now this is, sorry, I'm moving now to the relation between uh, rule following and meaning. And uh, this is another sort of, um, okay, sorry, take that back. So, so one might say, okay, well, um, one claims that the words having a certain meaning is engendered or constituted 
by the person following a certain rule or a certain set of rules for the use of that word. Um, but how can you tell in any given case uh, what the rule is or what the rules are that engender a particular meaning? I mean, how can we tell which are the rules, for instance, that for the use of a given word that would result in the word meaning dog? or would result in the word meaning true, or whatever. Okay, how do we answer that question? Um, well, I say that uh, basically we answer that question in the same sort of way that we answer questions of property constitution uh, everywhere else in science. Um, I mean, this is, after all, an issue of property constitution. We have the property W means dog, the property of a word that it means dog to a given person, I say. And we're asking, well, what is the underlying property that constitutes that higher level property, underlying at the level of rule following? Okay. And uh, how do we find which underlying property it is? Well, how do we do that generally in science? Well, I say that in physics, chemistry, biology, everywhere else, what we do, and I think quite reasonably, is uh, we suppose that a given superficial property, relatively superficial property, is constituted by whatever underlying property would explain the characteristics of the superficial property. So, for example, um, there's the property being a sample of water. Uh, why do we take it that that is constituted by the underlying property being made of H2O molecules? Well, because that hypothesis allows us to explain why water has the characteristics it does, why it's colorless, tasteless, liquid, that boils at 100 degrees centigrade, and so on. So on the basis of the assumption that it's H2O, made of H2O, we can explain the characteristics of the superficial property. And that's how these issues of property constitution are settled. So bringing that over to the present case, we're interested in discovering what constitutes the property W means dog, say, a given meaning property. So we have to find out what underlying property would explain the characteristics, the symptoms of the presence of the superficial property. Well, what are the symptoms that need to be explained? Well, I think the symptoms of a word's meaning what it does is its overall use. It's that we tend to accept certain sentences containing it under certain circumstances and not to accept other sentences containing it under certain circumstances. So it's a huge range of overall usage of the word that is explained by the word having a certain meaning. So it's that overall usage then that needs to be explained by whatever property is a good candidate for constituting the meaning. So, therefore, the answer to the question is, what rules should we take to constitute a given meaning? We should be looking for those basic rules of use, the following of which would explain, in conjunction, obviously, with other factors, uh, the words overall use. And, as I say, what I mean by the overall use, what I have in mind, are that certain sentences containing the word accepted under certain circumstances, other sentences containing the word are not accepted under certain circumstances, and so on. Well, by accepted here, I put accepted in scare quotes, because I have in mind a slightly technical use of the word accepted. I'm not talking about utterance. I'm not talking about something which is necessarily public. Uh, I have in mind a, a kind of internal acceptance of the sentence, a psychological notion which perhaps might be identified with putting the sentence into one's belief box, if you like that metaphor. Okay, it's a certain way of relying on the sentence in theoretical and practical inference. So anyway, so what we should be doing is looking for basic rules that explain <coughs> the overall usage of the word. And those were the ones that we could take to constitute its meaning. And at the end there, I give a kind of a general form of what such a rule, I think, would look like. Uh, 
the rule for W might be to accept a certain sentence containing W, a specific one, underived, accepted, not on the basis of anything else, perhaps subject only in certain conditions C. And uh, we could see why that kind of basic rule might stand a chance of satisfying what I'm saying are the adequacy conditions, namely that you can explain overall usage of W on the basis of following such a rule. Because the rule itself talks about accepting sentences containing the word, and therefore we can deploy inferential models to see how accepting these sentences, the ones specified in the basic rule, under certain circumstances, would lead, in combination with other factors, to uh, accepting other sentences, because of inference. OK, so that's, I think, how the rules relate to the meanings. Now, turning to number five, we have another sort of Kripke-esque, skeptical uh, question. Um, Look, suppose we've identified some rules in that particular way that I've just suggested. Uh, the rules uh, constituting meaning a given thing, meaning, meaning dog, say. Um, how could our following those rules for the word explain why the word has the extension that it does? How would that, how would following certain rules, the one that account for the overall usage, um, explain the fact that such a word governed by those rules is true of these things and not true of those things? Um, well, I think there's a trivial and in fact correct answer to this question, as I indicated at the top. Uh, the way the explanation goes is simply this. Well, we've already made it plausible that following these rules constitutes meaning F, having a certain meaning. And trivially, as a kind of logical truth, uh, to mean if, if a word means dog, then it's true of dogs and only dogs. Similarly for other concepts, if a word means F, capitalized. It's true of Fs and only Fs. Okay, so by transitivity, you put those two things together, and you can explain why following these rules uh, leads to a word, for the, for the use of a word, leads to its having certain satisfaction conditions. Very trivial. Now, um, but, you know, Kripke and many others would say, no, that's not. That's not what I meant. That's not the kind of explanation we need. Uh, that's to trivialize the whole thing. Uh, now we've got, there's a real constraint here and uh, which hasn't been satisfied. What, what we really need is a direct explanation without, as it were, going through, as it were, as a precondition of judging that these rules constitute these meanings. We first not afterwards, but first have to show that following these rules would lead to this extension. And once we've got that direct explanation, that then uh, would be a basis for concluding that those rules can be what provides the word with its meaning. Okay, so we need some kind of direct explanation. I don't think that's correct. I don't think we need any direct explanation. But the direct explanation one reason to think that we shouldn't expect such a thing is to look at what it would have to be like. So I indicate in one, two, and three what that, what such a direct explanation would have to be like. <clears throat> it would have to be something like this. Look, we're following the rule, apply W to Fs and only Fs. Um, first premise would have to be that uh, if we follow that rule, then we would apply W to uh, an object in, if conditions were ideal, just in case the object were F. So uh, we're following the rule, apply W to dogs and only dogs. If that's our rule, apply this word to dogs and only dogs. Then, um, 
we would apply the word to dogs and only dogs if conditions were ideal. That would have to be the first premise. I'm not recommending this, but if one really uh, tried to conform to the adequacy condition of explaining the extension directly, that would have to be the first premise. The second premise would have to be some sort of reductive analysis of the true of relation. Uh, not just some sort of reductive analysis, this particular one. It would have to be the analysis which says W is true of X reduces to we would apply W to X in those ideal conditions. And then we would be able to deduce and hence explain why following the rule would lead to the word having the extension it does. Okay, so we could, as it were, satisfy the stronger condition of giving the direct explanation uh, in this particular way. But I think it's no good for a couple of reasons. In the first place, at least well, this reason certainly applies to me, maybe it wouldn't convince the rest of you, but uh, it presupposes inflationism about truth. Okay, so for this strategy to work, there has to be a reductive analysis of the true of relation, which I don't believe there is. Um, in the second place, problem B, uh, I think that the rule that it has to invoke, which is the one I uh, cite there, so in the case of dog, apply this word to dogs and only dogs. It's not at all plausible that that is the rule that we're following, that, that engenders the meaning of the word, that leads to a word meaning dog. Um, it's not that we don't follow that rule. But it's not the meaning constituting rule. Rather, what's plausible is that we follow that rule. We follow the rule, I'm going to apply, I want to apply this rule, sorry, I want to apply this word to dogs and only dogs. We follow that rule because we already mean something by the word. Um, and by following certain or basic implementable rules of justification. Okay. I mean, as it were, we care about the truth. Okay, as we'll come to that later. So we want to apply the word to dogs and only dogs, but only because we mean dog and because there are certain rules of justification that are the ones we more immediately follow and hope thereby to uh, have it come out that the word is applied to dogs and only dogs. We hope to reach the truth by means of following the rules of justification. So I'm saying that, that although we do, I'm not denying that we, most of us do want to follow rules, try to follow rules like, you know, uh, as it were, the truth norm, apply the word to dogs and only dogs, if it means dog. I'm not, I, I'm arguing that isn't in the meaning constituting rule. So uh, anyway, um, my bottom line on this point is that we can explain why following certain rules leads to the words having a certain extension, um, but only in this indirect, trivial way. Insisting on the more direct explanation, I think, is um, based on confusion and is not properly motivated. There's no reason to insist on the more direct explanation. And obviously, you couldn't give it. You did insist on it. Um, my final point here is that this um, result that I'm arguing for, that we shouldn't be insisting on a direct explanation of extension in terms of the underlying rules, it goes hand in hand with rejecting another way of imposing uh, another requirement that uh, Kripke and others have um, sometimes uh, insisted on, or they sometimes articulate the requirement. Think of it as the same requirement, but articulated in a slightly different way. They say that from whatever the meaning constituting facts are, or rules or whatever they are, you should be able to read off what um, the extension is. I think reading off from the rules what the extension would be, would be goes in hand in hand with directly explaining. Uh, what the uh, extension would be. Okay. Um, here's a related uh, question.
question, question six. Um, how could our following these rules explain certain norms which govern a word in virtue of its meaning? How could it, the fact that we follow these rules, the word dog, say, how could that explain that we ought to apply the word only to dogs? Um, again, I think the explanation can be given and is quite trivial. As indicated on the handout, it's the explanation is just, well, we follow these rules. That constitutes our meaning, what we do. That explains why the word has some satisfaction conditions. That is why it's true of dogs and only dogs. And that explains why we ought to apply it only to dogs. Why does that last step work? How does the fact that it would be true only if applied to dogs explain that we ought to apply it only to dogs? Well, because truth is valuable. Um, it seems to me, this is a, uh, could be a lecture all in itself, but just to summarize it, that our respect for the truth, our concern for truth, our desire to have beliefs that are not false, to avoid false belief, and in fact, to extend our range of true beliefs, I seems to me this is a basic virtue. I think of it as a moral virtue, which would make commitment to truth. Um, it's also pragmatically beneficial. <coughs> I don't think it reduces simply to being pragmatically beneficial, but it is pragmatically beneficial. And I think uh, it is because of its pragmatic benefits that it is that this respect for truth is inculcated and acknowledged within a community as a moral virtue. And so uh, it's in virtue of that that we can go from the truth conditions or satisfaction conditions of a predicate to these particular norms uh, governing its application, because truth is valuable. Um, OK. So uh, what then, in the end, in light of all this, should we say about the widely debated question, is meaning normative? Um, well, I think the first thing we should say is that that's a terrible question and a confused question. And it, um, it has to, we have to make some distinctions. So I answer the question by, first of all, making three distinctions that I've listed here. In the first place, we have to distinguish between <clears throat> a notion being cons constitutively or constitutionally or maybe intrinsically normative um, and it's a notion having normative mm -hmm. import or there being certain norms governing it. So um, a word like good uh, or rational or ought is constitutionally normative. It is itself a normative notion, an evaluative, these are evaluative terms. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, a, a notion like uh, killing, killing a person, right, that has normative import. There are norms concerning it, namely you should not do it. But it itself is not a normative notion. Okay. So first of all, we have to make that distinction. And once that distinction is made, then it's obvious that just from the fact that certain norms govern something, that we cannot directly infer that thing is constitutionally normative, as in the case of you know, killing is wrong. Uh, there are norms governing killing, but that doesn't make killing itself a normative notion in the way that good and ought and so on are normative notions. 
So similarly, just from the fact that if you mean dog by a word, you ought to apply it only to dogs. So there are norms governing the meaning property. That doesn't make the, mean, the meaning property itself a normative property. It's obvious. <clears throat> Second distinction, I think, that's very important. We need to distinguish between concept of evaluative, something being a notion being an evaluative notion and it being a regulative notion. Um, what I have in mind here is that evaluative notions are like the notions I just mentioned as being normative, uh, good, ought, rational, and so on. Uh, a regulative notion, what I mean by that, is the notion of following a rule. Let's say a certain person is following such and such a rule. Okay, so that notion, the notion of following a rule, or any notion defined in terms of following a rule, is regulative. Okay, regulative and evaluative are clearly two different things. There's nothing specifically evaluative in the fact that somebody is following a certain rule. I may decide I'm going to follow the rule as I walk along the street. I'm not going to step on any of the cracks in the pavement. That is my rule when I walk home. Uh, okay, that's just a fact about me. If one thinks crudely in terms of the fact value distinction, okay, then you know something being good is on the value side. Something ought to be done is on the value side. That someone believes that something is good, that's on the fact side. Somebody that, if in a, the, the fact that in a given community certain things are regarded as good, that's on the fact side. And somebody's following a particular rule is on the fact side. Okay. So anyway, there's, these things shouldn't be muddied together, the evaluative and the regulative. And so I would say then, in terms of the picture I've given, I have uh, conceded that meaning facts reduce to rule-following facts. So in this terminology then, meaning is regulative, but not no reason to think that it's normative. It does have normative import, as I've tried to explain, but that doesn't make it constitutionally normative, and in my model, course, it isn't constitutionally normative. Um, final distinction is between the regulative and the fundamentally regulative. And what I mean there is, you, know, you look at someone like Robert Brandon, he also argues that meaning reduces to rule following, but he thinks that rule following cannot be analyzed away in terms of anything more fundamental. That's at the bottom. And so, from his point of view, meaning is not only regulative, it's fundamentally regulative. Whereas in my picture, since the rule following itself eventually gets analyzed away in terms of non-normative, non-regulative, non-semantic facts about ideal laws, then I would say uh, that meaning, although regulative, is not fundamentally regulative. Okay. Now, final boring point, but one obviously has to make some decision. Once you've made this distinction between the evaluative and the regulative, you've got to somehow decide, well, how is one going to use the word normative in relation to these other more specific <coughs> notions? Shall we have normative be a broad notion which includes the evaluative and the regulative? Or shall we say normative only applies to the evaluative? I don't know that it doesn't really matter. My estimation is to go with the second of these and reserve normative for the evaluative. So in which case, my own picture would have it be that uh, meaning is not constitutionally normative, um, and uh, although it does have normative import, and it's uh, regulative but not fundamentally regulative. Okay, final point. Um, 
everything I've been saying so far, I regard as something of a simplification, oversimplification perhaps, um, because I've just been talking about, as it were, the idiolect of a given person. So Chomskyans out here will think, that's fine. Don't need to worry about anything else. But I uh, am concerned with the fact that at least in ordinary, in the most ordinary contexts, I think, although I do think there is such a thing as the idiolect and the meaning of a person's word in their own idiolect, I think uh, there is also the notion of the meaning of the word in the linguistic community. Maybe a fuzzy notion, unsatisfactory for scientific purposes, blah, 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 but still I think there is such a notion. And uh, where does that fit into this if we think that meaning resides in some sense in the community? Um, well, I just sketch here how I think that complication should go. First of all, I think that we should say, and this is following people like you know, Burge and Putnam, that what it is for a word to have a certain meaning in a community is for the relevant experts, perhaps in some cases that's just the majority of people, to be following certain rules. Okay, so to look at the meaning, to what determines the meaning in the whole community, you should be looking at the rules followed by, let's say, the experts or the majority. Then when you turn to the individual, how do you decide what a particular individual means by a word? Well, that individual means that very same thing, the same thing as the community by the word, given three conditions are satisfied that I have here. First of all, the person must be a member of that community. Uh, secondly, the person must be following a certain rule of use for that word. And thirdly, that rule of use can't be terribly different from the rule that is followed by the experts. Now, of course, there is fuzziness and unclarity in all of these conditions, but that's just life. Um, so under those circumstances, when the person's rule does not overly diverge from the rule of the experts uh, and the person is in that community, maybe that's a matter of there being certain relations of deference to that to certain experts, then we can say the individual means that thing. Now uh, that potential for discrepancy hmm between the individual's basic rules of use for a word and the community or the experts or the majority's basic rules of use leads itself to certain norms that I haven't talked about yet because um, it's actually desirable for the sake of smooth, smooth communication that the different members of the community have the same basic rule of use Communication will misfire to the extent that there are great discrepancies between the basic rules of use used by, relied on by different people. And therefore, we get the third point, that if S means that thing by his word, then although he in fact follows the rule R prime, which... Um, diverges somewhat from the rule followed by the majority. He ought to follow R. Okay. Um, now that, it seems to me, is the source of some of our epi basic epistemic norms. So take something like uh, modus ponens. It's, I think, plausible that, um, that the rule, as it were, of the experts that constitutes partly at least, what we, that we mean what we do by uh, if-then is to um, abide by modus ponens, to abide by the rule you know, from P and if P then Q, infer Q 
Um, now that's the, as it were, rule of the experts. So it seems to me we get the result that if somebody means what we do by if then, then they ought to follow modus ponens, which is a, one of our basic epistemic norms. So I think we can get out of this some kind of account, at least of certain epistemic norms. Uh, sorry I've gone on for so long, and obviously there are further questions, but that's the best I can do in an hour. Thank you. following your law of nature. But uh, there seems to me uh, an important difference between the two cases, which is that in um, paradigmatic cases of laws of nature, for example, Kepler's laws that you have uh, quoted, it's probably the case that the rule is never followed, or that the law is never really obeyed by any natural phenomenon, like in Kepler's laws. There is no planet at all which exactly follows Kepler's law. So there, there are only exceptions. And this um, big idealized situation is never really uh, exemplified. Mm -hmm. And with respect to the rules uh, gov governing the use of words, it would seem contradictory uh, at first sight. Uh, if there was a word which was never applied following to its rule. If there were only exceptional cases, uh, yeah. well, it would, it would seem contradictory that a word would always be misapplied. But that's just the case for natural law, or for some of these laws like Kepler's. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. And uh, what does it mean? I mean, I. I mean, look, it's a very good point. Now, so how can I you know, reply to it? <clears throat> One possibility would be that I could, if I was, you know, have enough time and I could get back to you tomorrow, think, no, no, there are these cases in science where, in fact, uh, the, uh, you know, the ideal law is, in fact. There can be cases where none of the potentially distorting factors are present and, so at the top of my head, I can't think of such a case, but I wouldn't be that surprised if there were, I could eventually think of such a case where, you know, we, uh, where, um, where we're just all the distorting factors are occasionally absent or often absent, and the ideal law really does describe the thing. Uh, but suppose I can't. Um, of course, the fundamental, Sorry. I consider Kepler's law absolutely wrong. And there are better laws and combinations of laws that could account for every phenomenon you know, that, uh, that are misfortunes of Kepler's law. Yeah, but that's going too far for me, you see, because it's important that there be, uh, in order to get the relation to rules which are, um, can be followed without being obeyed, that uh, the laws don't, in fact, explain everything in every circumstance. So, now, um, now suppose though it turns out that I can't think of such a case, and we've got something different about the ideal laws that are being postulated here. Um, so, so my point about how this is precisely like what we get elsewhere in science would be an exaggeration. It would be somewhat of a difference. But still, I think the important thing from my point of view is that still you could say, look, the way in which these hypotheses, these kinds of model are assessed is in terms of standard scientific methodology. And so there isn't any reason to think that we've got anything normative or non-naturalistic in here. So I could remain, I could continue to say that, even if the analogy with ideal gases, ideal rigid bodies, and so on, is slightly, is somewhat less than I have claimed. But I think that's a nice very nice point. Yeah, a very modest question. Are you tempted to treat of the use, for example, of the word like lion to denote a sculpture, a statue? Okay, like, you know, if you go to Dorfer Rochereau, there's, there's a statue of a lion. And yeah. You, you, you often hear people referring to the lion on the right. yeah. Now, are you? 
you want to account for this regularity in use on the basis of uh, something like an ideal law that would apply to the English word lion in English, for example, or do you think that you have to take into account distracting factors that it's that in fact uh, people are in fact making some kind of a mistake in applying the word lion to the you know, stone or the object like the stone that's sitting on the yeah that, that location. How, how, what's your what's your kind of well, um, you know, um, see, first of all, I should say that, of course, there are many, many different notions of meaning. And, uh, you know, there are sort of pragmatic things, there are implicatures, there's metaphor, there's, I don't know, uh, the propositional content versus the meaning of the type and the language. So there are many notions of meaning. I'm, I, my view, and I haven't really defended this, is that there is a notion which is more fundamental, which one hopefully will eventually put you in a position to talk about these other notions of meaning, which is the, just as it were, the semantic meaning of a word type in the language. And, um, okay, now, so I'm not trying to deal with playing with metaphor or anything about pragmatic issues here. Um, now another point is that as I emphasize, for me this is not a question of what is uttered, it's a question of what is internally accepted. Uh, now there is some fact of the matter, and I don't know what the answer is, as to whether when in somebody's thought, as it were, when they're looking at this statue, their word for lion goes into the leaf box. I mean, do they literally, is that the way they use it, or is it only in verbal output that the word line is used as a certain façon de parler, you know, as a metaphor or whatever, and in fact in thought something completely different is going on? I don't know what the answer is to that. Now, if it, if it is in fact the case that it's the word lion or the mentalese correlate of the word lion that is deployed just as much when you're looking at the statue as when you are looking at the uh, real thing, then that simply is a fact of usage, of acceptance, that the underlying rules would have to predict. Um, so so the, what, that, what that comes to is to say that then the when we're trying to identify what the fundamental rules are, they have to be rules that will explain that fact. Not the fact that it is a lion, the fact that we call it a lion, the fact that we are stimulated in those conditions to use the word lion. That has to be explained by the fundamental rules. Now, how do we determine whether it really is a lion? Well, of course, we don't think it is really a lion. Um, and the determination of whether it's a mistake is, is it really a lion? And we don't think it's a lion, so we are making a mistake. I do think it's a lion. Well, in that case, you think we're not making a mistake. But I mean, the point is, it's not, uh, insofar as one thinks it's not really a lion, then one thinks it's a mistake. If you think it is really a lion, then you think it's not a mistake. But that's an independent issue from the issue of how do we determine what the rules are governing that particular saying we do have to take into account of that usage, if that indeed is our internal usage, which is itself a question. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm wondering if there isn't the following difficulty with making meaning so uh, dependent on the notion of rule following. It seems to create big differences between uh, types of words that uh, on some intuitions and they don't seem to be that different. So take the case, for instance, it depends on what you believe about the presentation of the word. So take the case, the difference between A and B. A and B both believe that dogs exist, etc. And they sort of use dogs the same way. A believes that dragons exist and B doesn't. But in lots of contexts, they use dragon the same. As soon as we show the picture, that it's a good picture of a dragon. So, have to, so now to, to sort of uh, determine what they mean, what A and B mean by dragon, we have to do some sort of experiment 
get at the ideal sort of situation. It's going to be very hard because uh, <coughs> dragons don't exist. You know, you're going to have to try to look for different. So it's going to create a tremendous difference between the way we find out whether they have the same meaning for dog and the way we find out whether they have the same meaning for dragon. And that's going to be determined by a difference in beliefs, which might change over time. Maybe just one click, suddenly A gets convinced that dragons don't exist. But maybe the whole history of how we acquired these words would be the same, except for you know, that one sort of decided to exist. So it seems to, that's one case, but it seems to make differences in word meaning depend a lot on the ontological status of different, you know, the denotata of different words. You have different, so big differences between words that are supposed to sort of say something about the way that it is, right? Words that, words that don't, like number words and things like that. Are you willing to accept all of that, those differences? I think I am, if I understand you. I mean, I should have said, I mean, I sort of gestured towards something which I think might be relevant to what you're saying. Although maybe I should have emphasized it um, more. But the point is that, uh, though I've sort of just for simplicity spoken as if, well, we've got the overall use of the word and we look for the rules that explain it, um, which suggests that it's a very non holistic thing. You've got the use of this word and you look for the rules that explain that. You've got the use of that word and you look for the rules that explain that. Uh, in fact, of course, it's never like that because. Um, any sentence that is accepted and that needs to be explained on the basis of rules um, is going to contain lots of words. And so uh, the, the factors that go into explaining the acceptance of a given sentence will at the very least involve the rules, basic rules concerning all the words in that sentence together with other factors, what's happening in the environment, certain general psychological principles. So it's a giant, holistic, epistemological enterprise to, as it were, simultaneously come up with the best account of the basic rules for all the different words in the language uh, that will enable us to explain all these things. And so I certainly, uh, certainly true that this is a very complicated holistic business. Um, I don't think that um, the, that complexity will be reduced, or that as it were, epistemological difficulty would be would be diminished if one took rule following out of the picture. Um, I uh, I don't. Um, I should be clear, I guess, that I don't think that uh, rule following needs to be in this picture. Uh, I think that um, we f it's not unnatural to think about, think of these phenomena in terms of rule following. Uh, that is, rules of grammar, the rules constituting the meanings of words. Not unnatural. On the other hand, it's not compulsory, I don't think. I mean, as I said, it's, it's, they're very far from the paradigm cases of rule following. So they should be kind of rule following in scare quotes. You know, you can motivate talking about rule following. Um, on the other hand, if you decided, look, it's not worth it, that's just scrap to talk about rule following, because it's not really genuine, full-blooded rule following. Let's just miss out that step and go directly you know, reduce the meanings to the ideal laws and skip all the talk about rule following, that would be fine with me. But I don't think one would have made one's job significantly easier by doing that because these holistic, giant epistemological problems would equally arise uh, when you try to figure out, you know, what are the ideal laws that lie behind uh, each of the words. It might be very easy to find the ideal law say for two uh, or three, and so hard that it's practically impossible to find the ideal law for dragon, and maybe in between to find the ideal law. Yeah. So you're making a tremendous difference between just how you can sort of get a theory of meaning, get to a theory of meaning, that depends on facts like what kind of beliefs that people have about you know, whether dragons exist or something. Oh, the beliefs that people have, that is the, the things that they accept, are the data. <coughs> Those are the data that this Postulate the, the, the postulated 
ideal laws for each word are supposed to explain. And uh, there is a big mass of data. And any particular datum is going to be explained by many, many different causal factors. And so it's a very difficult job. Now, nonetheless, as you say, it might be easier to answer this question in the case of some words than others. Um, but uh, I'm not really, you know, the kind of word that it will be easiest, in some sense, to answer the question for. Um, but although the answer won't be a full one, it will at least be a partial answer, it will be the concepts that we think of as most superficial. You know, I mean, if you take something like, uh, I mean, just maybe this involves an element of pretense, but uh, take the word bachelor and pretend that it is, in fact, uh, defined as unmarried man, then, then perhaps the rule of use uh, constitutes the, uh, the, uh, the meaning of bachelor is something like, accept the sentence, someone is a bachelor just in case they're an unmarried man. Now, that's it, very simple. But of course, immediately a question arises because you say, well, that isn't really a non-semantic reduction because after all, surely that accepting that sentence only gives you the meaning of bachelor relative to the meanings of the other words in it. So only if one means what one standardly does by unmarried and man will accepting that sentence constitute. Meaning. So it just pushes the problem back to more fundamental meaning. And so in the end, you can't give a full answer in the case of any meaning until you've got down to the bottom. And at the bottom, uh, if there is a bottom, um, it's what seems like, what seems certainly possible is that, that there'll be certain very fundamental notions where or fundamental terms standing for them, where the laws, the rules, will talk about their use in relation to one another. It won't be a sort of separate rule for each notion. And those will be very hard to identify. But I, I don't think it matters. If you, if, you, if you really don't like this talk about rule following, if you think it just sort of mystifies things, uh, then get rid of it. It's fine with me. I don't think that's going to make the uh, ultimate epistemological problem any easier. So, <coughs> Two general remarks and then more specific points. First, I missed the talk, tight token distinction in the talk. No, I think you introduced it in the, <coughs> in the discussion period, but I yes. think that would have been relevant at many points, except that you probably don't think it is relevant given your own conception of the meaning of words. And that leads me to the second point I wanted to make, which is that there is a, a mixture in the talk of a, a general structure which any satisfactory theory of meaning should fit, or something like that. So you've got this general pattern for a theory of meaning. On the one hand, and on the other hand, you obviously have a specific theory in mind. And, and, and the problem is that you have maybe the structure, the abstract structure, is, as it were, tailor made for your own theory. So it's Hard for me to tell when something is, is really needed or justified in general, and when you actually put it forward simply because you have that theory in mind, theory according to which work types express concepts or something like that, which is what you seem to have in mind. Now, my more specific worry is that the, in the case of, of water, you said that we have certain superficial uh, property, the property of being water with a certain number of characteristics. And the underlying property is that which will account for those underlying uh, those superficial characteristics. Now, the same thing should be true about meaning. Yeah. And you said, indeed, that the rule which we posit must explain the, the world's overall use. I really believe that the problem is we should, I mean, normally, in the case of water, we all agree that water is that transparent, liquid, odorless, and quenches thirst, and, and so on. Now, in the case of meaning, I, I wonder whether, whether we agree what are the characteristics of overall use. And one thing that seems to me very important, of paramount importance in the, those characteristics of overall use is the fact that we apply the world to certain things and not to others. Yes. So the extension 
of particular uses, not the extension of the world, but the extension of particular uses or what we are what we actually apply to the work to seem to me really what's basic. There are not so many things that are basic here. Uh, more basic, I think, that the thing that we mentally accept a certain sentence that we don't utter. That's not something that seemed to me really part of the of the of the scientific basis for for building the theory of meaning on, I think. But anyway, if you accept that the extension of words on the conditions of use are one of the things that are to be accounted for, one of the superficial characteristics, then it's unclear to me that we really need this sort of intermediary step that once we have the rule of use, it will not directly explain how we actually apply words to what we apply them. So I would be rather in <coughs> prima facie in favor of a, of a direct explanation. And I'm not sure I understand the, the arguments that you've given against, against that. Okay. But anyway, the question is, do we really need some extra step, this meaning that words have? Why not simply go from the rule of use to the extension of words upon occasions of yeah. use? Because I insist that the extension is maybe not something the property of the word type, but anyway. Um, okay. Uh, first, I think um, I recognize a serious you know, a pro potential problem for me in what you said, but there's something I don't agree with first your way of putting it, which is I think you tended to run together two separate things. One is uh, the things that we actually do apply the word to mm -hmm. and, and the extension. Um, that's different. Uh, the things we actually apply the word to are the things we believe are in the extension. And that's different from the actual extension, at least, you know, in particular, you know, so, so the, so what I'm saying is that uh, what I'm saying, which could be challenged, and I take the, the question lying behind this, that maybe you are challenging it, what I'm saying is that our obligation in coming up with a rule, or the basic rule for a word, is to something that explains our usage. That is, it precisely does explain what we do apply the word to and what we don't apply the word to. Because these are facts about us. We apply it to this, we apply, don't apply it to that. And these things are supposed to be explained, according to me, by the basic rules which we can take to constitute the meaning. Um, but the question, the skeptical Kripkin question, says, no, you know, what you have to explain is the actual extension. How can following this rule explain why it really does have this extension and not some other extension? And that's what I complained against. And I said, that isn't necessary. The, although in the end, the end one can get some kind of explanation of the actual extension it takes the trivial route that I sketched um, it isn't a direct explanation now someone might say well why do you say that why shouldn't it be the direct you know you say you have to explain in by the rule the characteristics of the word but who says that the characteristics have to be just the way we use the word, rather than also what its extension is. Why shouldn't that be one of the characteristics that needs to be explained? And, um, but then let me rephrase, no, I quite understand. But then why do we need to go beyond? I mean, in the case of water, we have to explain those superficial characteristics, and then we have this property, and we explain those characteristics. Why not, in the case of words, say that we have certain characteristics, how we, we use words, and then we have to explain that, and we pose it to the rule of use. What else is needed? Why meaning Nothing. extension? Well, 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 just a second. Why? Just look. Um, in the first place, look, I, I think maybe you're raising questions that I'm not even trying to address. I and mean, I'm taking for granted in this project something which, you know, uh, of course one can reasonably call into question in a different project. And for my project, I'm taking for granted that words have meaning. Yeah, that's, that's I'm taking it for granted that words have meaning. I'm taking it for granted that there are satisfaction conditions. I'm taking it for but granted. But not that you're using meaning in different senses. In your own theory, you have obviously a very substantial notion of what the meaning of a word is. But in the abstract structure, which you say in theory must satisfy, you use meaning in a way in which even I were rather skeptical well, of meaning no. in a more substantial sense. Okay. You're saying only meaning is only, you know, those superficial characteristics of use. Well, can that's, I, that's meaning, and in that sense, I let agree me try with that answer, Let me answer the, try and answer it. I, I begin with what I take to be not a not theoretically loaded uh, idea, 
which is that we have this conception of the meaning of a word in language. So that we have the word dog in English, and we can say it has the same meaning as other words in other languages. We have this notion of meaning. Now, that's, you know, I'm assuming that there is some such notion of the meaning of the word in a language. I also assume that uh, we say that this word is true of these things and not true of those things. So there is the notion of the truth conditions or the satisfaction conditions. I also assume, you know, that most of us think that there are certain norms to the effect that given the word's meaning, you ought to apply to this, you ought not to apply to that. So these I think of as kind of pre-theoretical data or intuitions or you know, things that we're inclined to say. And my project is to try and understand the relationships between these things, understand uh, how such facts, if there are such facts, are constituted at some ground level, some ground level. Okay, so now, now my own proposal, so this is just background assumptions. Of course, one can question anything, one can look at the question those, but those are my background assumptions. Uh, I don't think they're that controversial, that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile to question. Uh, so then one, my, I, you're right, I then have some specific proposals about how I think the relationships between these things go, the explanatory relationships, and how these phenomena, assuming they exist, are grounded uh, at some very basic, you know, physicalistic, sort of more or less physicalistic, non-semantic, uh, non-normative level. And that's where my own, you know, where I don't, I'm not saying this is just obvious. You know, mm -hmm. Now, but I, I do think, uh, maybe you, you're rejecting this, but I think there is a genuine and important question in what you said, for me, that deserves a good answer that I haven't at least given yet, which is, um, why do I not, uh, why am I not required to explain why the word has the extension it does in a direct way, just as I'm required to explain why the word is used the way it is in a direct way on the basis of the rules. Now, I'm not sure if that you still feel that that's the genuine question or whether you had in mind some other question. No, it, there is overall use is something that it's an observable fact, as it were, or maybe something that really we agree that must be accounted for, the overall use of a, of a word. And there is the theoretical notion we will use, the property that we will posit, the underlying property that explains that. And there is the fourth theory. And in the fourth theory, we have this notion of meaning. And it plays more or less that sort of role. It's supposed to account for the overall use property. But it's also a fault notion that has a number of properties. Uh, and, and obviously, when you say that you take for granted this fault theoretical notion, it's not just that there must be something doing that sort of work. Because if that were so, then that would be replaced by the, 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 the genuine theoretical notion we find when we've identified the right rule. So the, those other properties of the fault theoretical notion of meaning may be things that you actually take for granted and want to preserve in your own theory, which why I would rather yeah. say, let's forget about the fault theoretical notion, let's simply consider the overall use, what that consider, and let's find actually the rule that explains that use. And my point was, once we have identified the overall use properties that must be accounted for, and once we have found the rule that accounts for those properties, what else is needed? Why do we even need to appeal to this notion of extension of the work type as you, as you do? Well, it's, I don't know quite what this need amounts to. I mean, it's not, as far as I understand it, characteristic of uh, the way scientists speak. And once they've found a way of reducing some notion to some more fundamental level, they stop using that superficial notion altogether. You haven't eliminated it. You haven't shown that it doesn't exist. On the contrary, you've justified the claim that it does exist because it, after all, reduces to these other things. So. You know, we still talk about water, even okay. as scientists. Okay. So I don't see why we shouldn't still talk about meaning, just because we've discovered that it can be reduced to following certain rules of use. Okay. Yeah. 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 It is to, to transfer a question away. Take your point number six on the, on the back of uh, 
there, there, there's one uh, uh, inferential step uh, where, where, which uh, I would like to question. Uh, I agree with you that we have a concern for truth, and uh, let's decide whether it's a fundamental moral virtue, but okay, let's, uh, let's accept that. Uh, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't follow in any way um, that it's desirable to apply W only to S. Uh, um, only, or this follows only if you make a, another assumption, namely uh, um, that we get uh, 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 um, our true beliefs from literally true statements, so that that, that are, 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 and that if the statements are, are literally false, then we form false beliefs. Uh, uh, on, on that assumption, then indeed, departing uh, from, from you know, using using W to talk about any other F and to, to, to designate F as other would be misleading and, and, to, and, and cause information of uh, we would not, not fit well with our concern for truth. Um, but there is very little evidence that this is a useful mode of language. Uh, you may, you know, you may hold for a notion of meaning, a notion of little meaning, etc. But but, uh, but but you need much more than that. You need to argue. Uh, that, that, that there is some kind of what, rule, convention, whatever, such that uh, uh, we take as the normal meaning, the, 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 the by default meaning of an utterance, its literal meaning. Um, and, and then you can treat all the cases of Moonstoke, uh, metaphor, etc., as you know other pragmatic phenomena which you can put under the axle. And so, so you make a kind of an implicit division between a kind of normal use of uh, language. Uh, which is non pragmatic or which is transparently pragmatic because there's pragmatic has nothing to do with semantic, uh, basically. And then some deviant or acceptably deviant or non normal <coughs> uses which are handled by uh, uh, you know, the study of metaphor and or, or intuitive and other pragmatic phenomena. But this is highly questionable. Yeah. I mean, you and, think. And if it's, well, so you're not going to, to, to resolve it whether it's true or false. Uh, but, but, but imagine that it's, that it's this. Uh, 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 assumption is, is is mistaken. Doesn't the whole thing kind of hold on? Um, okay, um, let me try and get my mind around this. So, um, so what I'm claiming is that. Um, So let me try and sorry. Let me think. So I'm saying if a certain sentence is true, uh, so sorry, let me put it the other way around because it's more plausible. If a certain sentence is false, uh, then um, one ought not to accept it. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. slightly qualified. One ought, you know, one should. It's desirable not to accept it. Um, and why is that? What's the link? Well, I'm assuming that accepting the sentence implies believing what the sentence expresses. So I'm saying, I'm thinking, well, you shouldn't have a, I mean, I guess my implicit reasoning is, look, you oughtn't to have a false belief. It's undesirable to have a whole false belief. If you accept a sentence, in my sense, to accept, which is an internal psychological yes. matter. So the sentence is in your belief box. That's what it, if you accept a sentence which is in your belief box, then uh, that is to say you believe the proposition expressed by that sentence. And so if the sentence is false, then the belief is false. So now, which aspect of that are you denying? The problem comes with not with acceptance, but with the sentence. Uh, uh, because if, if you mean, if I accept, uh, Let's imagine that we have a language of thought, and so I accept a sentence in the language of thought and, and my belief box that I, it better be true. I, I want it to be true, etc. Yeah. That's fine. That's all I mean, though. No, 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 that's a, that can't be all that you mean, because you're not, you have no data about language of thought, and you're talking about natural language. And, 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 all and, right. And, and so there is no evidence whatsoever that in, in my belief box I have any sense of natural language. And if, if I had it, they wouldn't provide me with belief because they, they, under, they don't express proposition. Express proposition relative to context. Right. Uh, 
so, so, so there is no question. Sentences of natural language are not things to accept or not accept. Yeah. They're not proposition to begin with. Uh, the, oh. Except, they're not. No, I know, but I remember uh, except is being used in this technical sense. No, no, so yeah, it's not, it's, the fact that they're not propositions, I mean, so we I'm wouldn't not, say we accept. I'm not objecting yeah. to use of accept, I'm objecting to use of sentence. I'm telling you uh, <coughs> an utterance in, in, in English, or for that matter, an utterance in uh, token of, uh, of a sentence in language of thought, uh, 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 are not. Uh, 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 sorry, I use a second time. An utterance in English. Uh, uh, um, is, is not accepting an utterance. It's not like accepting the sentence that was uttered. Is you, you have to accept more. You have to accept the interpretation uh, of the sentence that was uttered. At the very minimum, you have got to, 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 to put in the you know, fixed reference of the referring expression. But typically, you have to go much uh, beyond that. Uh, uh, so, so the concern for truth in communication and, and in the use of natural language. Uh, uh, causes us not to want to say things which are misleading, which would cause false belief in others. But it's not as if we copied our, our you know, we formed our belief by copying the little meaning of the utterance. First, of the sentence uttered. First, because that in any case is not propositional. And second, even if you fill it in by fixing the reference so that it becomes propositional, it just isn't, uh, I would argue, the default uh, 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 strategy to look first at the little meaning complemented with, with uh, by fixation of reference as you know the thing to be believed accepted or not accepted and then maybe if somebody has some problem going to into for it or use expression uh, uh, yeah. can I just ask you a question of clarification you are you is, is your I mean is your point dependent mm -hmm. on your conviction which may be right that mm -hmm. uh, that Natural language sentences are always in some way context dependent, so that uh, they never have, uh, there's never a sort of a fixed particular proposition that they express in the language. Is, that, is, is your point very heavily dependent on yes, that? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, I want yeah, to say okay. it like that. Sure. Okay, okay. Do you, do you agree that the, the, the uh, triangle is above the line? I do. But there is no triangle, there is no line. How could you know? You're you, you, you using a, a triangle loosely. I mean, surely yeah. this is not a triangle, this is not a line. Okay. Uh, uh, and that's normal use of language. Yeah, but I'm not using except so, so, in the normal use. I, as I said, for my use is a technical well, use. Where did, where, did, sorry, so where did you accept when you accepted? Well, I accepted the, look, the, the most. Did you, did you accept, did you accept no. the meaning of a sentence I uttered? Oh. Or did you accept some construction based on that, starting, you know, triggered by that, which loosened both the notion of. of a time and a notion of a line, so that indeed what you accept is true, indeed, but, you know, but, but, but it's not the meaning uh, of a sentence which well, I Look, um, I'm not sure this is relevant. I mean, of course, there is a notion of acceptance, which is the ordinary language notion. What is accepted and what is a proposition? Okay, like believing it or something like that. And, and, uh, okay, maybe I should have used a different word, but anyway, I did explain I wasn't supposed to be the ordinary language word. So, um, I mean, for my purposes, why isn't it? Maybe it's a more limited claim, and I have to work harder to show how it can get expanded to cover all language. But pretend I'm just talking about the language of thought. It says a predicate in the language of thought, and uh, that predicate is applied to certain things in the sense of a certain sentence goes into the belief box. Then I would say that, you know, uh, the desirability of Applying it to certain things and not others follows from the truth of applying to things and not others uh, relative to the value of the truth. Now, now it gets messy, no doubt, because of the fact that the relationship between the natural language sentence and the sentence of Mentalese is not just some one to one thing. Uh, okay, I. If optimistic. I'm optimistic. If you're making, if you're making this point about the language of thought, you have not begun uh, providing a theory of meaning in, in, in the only sense in which you want a theory of meaning, that is a theory of meaning in language. Well, remember, uh, this is not the, this question that you're raising isn't about the theory of meaning. It's about explaining normative certain normative facts, which is something that comes right in the end. I think it took me <clears throat> tells me a lot if you could. Uh, 
composed of the different things. We'll see what's new. Uh, take the following. Uh, take the word dog. <laughs> Something new. <Well, laughs> well, we 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 have been using the word for some time immemorial. We have plenty of examples and stuff. But now uh, there is a, a, an animal there, and uh, it's uh, genetically engineered uh, something. So the problem is: should we apply the word dog to it, or should we not? And the thing is that, uh, quite obviously, um, there is no factor. There is no capital cancer. So what does the rule, the generalization, the whatever, tells us? Tell us nothing. Well, just to, sorry, Wait. can I interrupt you? Because I think there's already something which is uh -huh. with parted company. Because I'm not thinking of the rules that we're looking for, as, as rules to tell us what we ought to say or what we ought not to say, right. to decide the question, is it really a dog or isn't it a dog? I'm not talking about rules that would do that. What I'm saying is, we actually have a practice. Look at an individual, not at the community. An individual has a practice. I don't know, look at, you know, me. I mean, I don't know whether I would, you know, either I say it's a dog, or I refuse to say it's a dog, or I say, I scratch my head and say, I don't know. But anyway, I have some usage of the word in relation to the situation. And I have uh, hundreds of other things I do. I'm looking for the rules, or if you like, the more fundamental level laws that explain that behavior. The rules are not supposed to tell me what I ought to say. No, 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 but wait. If I understand the skeptical, uh, skeptical explain correctly, what he says is that every case of of the word is a new case, just like this. Exactly. So if you take Kripke's example, it's exactly what he says. There is the example of 57 plus 68, which is supposed to be a new application. And the problem is, is it a correct, is it correct, or is it not to say that the result is 135? Or take the word uh, another example, which you find in uh, the word table. Here is a new example, not far from here, in the Tura uh, The example said there is a table in the at the entrance of the first bell which you've never seen. Uh, maybe nobody has seen. Is it a table or is it not? And here the point is that the distinction between what pe you or people believe is a dog or a table or whatever. And what in fact is a dog or a table or whatever, it doesn't seem that it simply doesn't apply. This is not the point. Uh, it takes a decision to apply or not to apply. And what we've been doing in the past is not going to help us. So the rule which you carefully extracted from the, from the past examples. Um, I mean, which? Yeah, I think, I mean, look, Marco, I think, you know, you can be uh, forgiven for reading Kripke in that way. I, because I think that Kripke, I think, you know, although I think it's one of the most important books in philosophy in the last 50 years, I have the ultimate respect for it. There are things wrong. And uh, one thing is wrong, I think, is that Kripke is very fuzzy and unclear about the relationship between meaning and rule following. He talks about... This is a problem for meaning, apparently, you know, a skeptical problem about meaning, a skeptical problem. In the same sense, you know, the next sentence he's talking about rule following, he's switching backwards and forwards, and you don't really know how these things are supposed to relate to one another. Um, I think the best way of reconstructing the argument is that it's, that it's supposed to be fundamentally a problem about rule following. So it's a problem about meaning because meaning reduces to rule following. And so we've got a problem about rule following. The rules may have to do with language or nothing to do with language. We've got the problem. And what is the problem? The problem is when all you see is a certain bunch of behavior or activity, how can you extract out of that which rule a person is implicitly following? 
assuming now we're not talking about explicit rule following, so it's not a question of looking into their mind and finding a sentence, figuring out what it means, you know, it's a question of, you know, we've got a bunch of behavior, sort of inclinations or dispositions to do this, not to do that, you know, and how can we tell what the rule is? So, uh, and here we look at the word table and we see somebody's inclined to apply it to this, and they're not inclined to apply it to that, and they whole bunch of occasions, we look at an individual, say, and we want to figure out um, what's the rule they're following. And uh, in order to do that, um, you know, there are a number of issues that make this difficult. One is that these rules tend to have infinite implications, uh, whereas the data we've got just seems to be only finite. A certain number of applications and refusals to apply on particular occasions. Um, so for that reason, Kripke said, well, suppose you made it dispositions to apply. In that case, we could get the infinity. But then there's the problem of mistakes that I mentioned earlier. You know, somebody you can't just get the rule, obviously, out of observing the behavior, because some of the behavior uh, are cases of violating the rule, which is, in fact, the one being followed. So this is the kind of problem that Kripke says he doesn't see any way to solve it. Now, I am making a proposal about that. I say, look for the ideal law. So, uh, you know, look, and, and that's to be judged on the basis of simplicity. That will determine what the rule is that they're actually following. And it's not a question of you know, truth, really. It's a question of finding something that accounts for actual usage. Okay. Very last question. But are you saying that the problem, there are two possibilities here. Are you saying that you're only considering past uses no. of words? No. Or are you saying that new applications, uh, I mean, application of a word or a rule to a new case cannot be um, as new and uh, as radically different from the previous ones no. as these kept the No, I'm saying, look, we've got, we've got, as Kripke explains, we've got a metaphysical problem and we've got an epistemological problem. Um, metaphysically, uh, it's not really metaphysics, but anyway, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, scientifically, explanatorily, the problem is, what are the under, one of the facts at some underlying level that constitute it's being the case that this person is following this rule? Okay. Um, my answer is, it's a matter of their behavior being governed by a certain ideal law. And that's supposed to apply to present, past, future. You know, that's the rule. Then, of course, epistemologically, you've only got the past to go on. So how do we, you know, how do we go about figuring out what the law is that is governing their behavior? Well, of course, they're fallible. We've only got the past data, and we get the best theory we can based on our observations of what the person has done. And we project as we do generally with laws of nature. We we have to uh, use induction and whatever abduction, and, and we. Well, in that case, <laughs> one more question. This gentleman, I mean, this is not a short, short question. Sure. You were equivocating a little bit. Sometimes you talk about the law, but uh, sometimes you talk about the laws. As if you could consider the possibility that for each word there was a law, which is very unscientific. So there's no laws just for water. There are laws for molecules and things like that. So uh, the laws Would you accept the following version as a legitimate version of your enterprise? Mm -hmm. All laws, what we look for are laws that have nothing to do with individual words. The only valid laws are laws that no. intersect to determine all the no. 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 Well well maybe I'm not sure. See I do think that there is an analogy, I mean maybe it certainly affected my way of thinking between what I what one can say about language and Words, the acceptance of 
sentences on the one hand, and something like fundamental particle physics on the other hand. I mean, in the case of fundamental particle physics, what you do is you say, look, uh, everything is made of these particles. So this is what we want to discover. For each kind of particle, like electrons and you know, neutrinos or whatever, there are going to be the basic laws that apply to that kind of thing. Okay. Then, of course, there will be general laws that don't apply to any specific kind of particle, something like, you know, Newton's laws of motion or modern variants of that. Okay. They don't talk, let me finish, they don't talk about specific. So we've got the laws which are specific, tell you, look, an electron does this. You know, fundamentally, these are the basic properties. Then there are the general laws. Put all that together and we explain what happens to the table. You know, or what happens when these particles are stuck together in various ways. So I think the analogy is, well, in the case of language, what corresponds to the fundamental particles are the words or morphemes. And uh, what we want are some specific laws about these particles. Sometimes they can refer to the relation, you know, the behavior of particles in relation to one another. Okay, so that the fundamental law it tells you about our electrons relate to neutrinos, so similarly in the case of words. Then some further general laws, which have nothing to do with specific words. Uh, you put that all together, and you get what happens when you stick these words together, why you accept these sentences and these circumstances, and not those sentences and those circumstances. So that's the, that's the, the there is, I think, an analogy there. No one would be happy to check with that. Nobody would be happy if fundamental physics proposed 50,000 different laws because at least 50,000 different versions that the average adult knows at least you know, one. Yeah. So are you happy with having 50,000 different laws? Um, <coughs> well, you, am I happy with there being separate laws for each word? Mm. Um, well, look, something has to be said about each word. Otherwise, you're not going to explain what the distinctive. Yeah, the, no, well, I mean, so no, it's different, I think, about the planets, you know, because there is no particular. You don't have to say something about each planet. You know, just the same law of the so But in the case of each word, because the analogy is supposed to be not between the words and the planets, but the words and the fundamental particles, you do have to say something about each kind of fundamental particle. And you have to say something about each fundamental element in the language. So something has to be said about each one. And uh, that's not to say that they don't, in some sense, group together. So that, you know, maybe there's something you have to say about the word red, which is uh, in common with what you say about the word yellow. But that's not going to be the whole story. There's something you have to say about the word red, which is different from what you say about the word yellow, to explain why the usage of red and yellow are not exactly the same. Uh, yes, um, I felt that you were uh, addressing Kripke's problem too early. Um, I, 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 I thought that uh, Kripke's problem arises uh, at the level of uh, communal meaning rather than uh, uh, as early as uh, uh, maybe the language of this uh, problem. And uh, so if we follow your framework, uh, your framework um, the problem would be that we never know uh, uh, and reading the point eight. The problem is that uh, we never know who will be the FX pass, who will de decide um, what, uh, what rule we should uh, follow. And if we, if we don't know, if we have to accept that there are some contingent facts about uh, who will be the FX pass, then we can't get to the third line, uh, S means F by W, then uh, S need to follow from the rule. Yeah. Um, good. Well, actually, I'm not, I don't think I agree with you about the way the problem gets raised in Kripke. I think Kripke begins by asking about an individual, um, this person, I think it's Smith. Uh, you know, so what are the facts in virtue of which Smith, or is it Jones, I don't know, means plus by this symbol, you know. So he's looking about that particular person, wants to know, what is it about that person that's responsible for his meaning, what he does? 
And uh, now the way the community gets brought in in Kripke is because having, you know, sort of failed to that, he argues there isn't any good answer to that question. We cannot find underlying facts. But on the other hand, he doesn't want to just simply throw away the notion of meaning. And he says, well, you know, he's, uh, so he, 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 he um, suggests that this talk about meaning uh, plays a certain role, important role in discourse, um, but it's not fact stated. It's rather like what the motivists say about ethical discourse. They're not, they don't, they're not intended to state facts. You know, when you say something is right or wrong, they're intended to express certain attitudes or get people to do certain things. So similarly, in the case of meaning, according to Kripke, but um, he goes on to say that that way of making sense of meaning talk can only apply if a person, I mean, we can only apply that talk to a person if that person is a member of a community, because I guess he thinks that we can only really understand the normativity involved in meaning, or the normative import of a word's meaning, what it does. Uh, we can only really understand that if we think of it as of the norms coming from this idea of correction by other people in the community. And I'm myself am quite sympathetic to that. I myself am saying that that we can only have, as it were, meaning, think of meaning in terms of rule following, uh, and really motivate the talk about rule following if what the person is doing is at least partly the result of pressure from the outside. Um, now, I tried to have that both ways in a way because I also indicated that I wouldn't really care that much if you dropped the notion of rule following um, altogether. Or maybe there is even, you know, this, maybe one could say, well, we can keep the notion of rule following, but we can um, understand it even more weakly than I've suggested if one, if one um, supposes that the kind of correction that is required to justify talk of rule following can come from within, from inside. You might say, well, there's surely a kind of self-correction that might uh, apply, so we don't really need the community after all. But anyway, but I, I'm sort of digressing a bit, but it seems to me that in Kripke, this the community comes in in order to try and accommodate the normativity of meaning. I don't think Kripke himself addresses puzzles which you are mentioning, and I think are very real ones and important ones, about uh, how you identify who the experts are. And, you know, it seems to me each of my three conditions here that I introduce when I'm talking about when you can say that an individual means what the community means, that has this fuzziness and unclarity in all of them. Um, uh, but um, uh, so to some extent that fuzziness I think ought to be reduced by further work which I haven't done uh, but to some extent I think it's just there really there and nothing you know and it's not, a, not an objection that it should be there because there really can be a genuine indeterminacy in um, in the question of whether somebody does or does not uh, mean uh, what the same as everyone else in their community. Thank you very much, Paul.